discussing about the topic related to bhagwan's avatar so it is said whenever there is a decline of dharma and when there is an upsurge in adharma bhagwan takes birth yesterday we were seeing different meanings of dharma at the superficial level dharma means cosmic orderliness cosmic harmony cosmic balance but what is it that which sustains this orderliness we saw that eternal values of life sustain this orderliness so at a deeper level dharma means eternal values of life we saw the meaning of dharma as that which integrates which binds which upholds which keeps things together dharanat dharma now the next question is what is the basis for these eternal values from where do they arise what brings them forth so now we will discuss the meaning of dharma from the absolute standpoint dharma has got so many different shades of meaning so now let's discuss dharma from the absolute standpoint how is it defined dharma of a thing is defined as that without which a thing has no existence dharma of a thing is that without which a thing is no more that thing for example dharma of fire is heat you can never have a cold fire similarly dharma of sugar is sweetness if it is not sweet it cannot be sugar now the important question is what is our dharma what is that without which we have no existence when we analyze we find that it is the consciousness in us it is the consciousness which lends sentiency to the inert body mind complex consciousness is the life giving principle which keeps us alive the body the mind and the intellect are able to function only because they are enlivened by the sentient factor called consciousness again it is this consciousness which is the very core of our being which we call i the self 
So this I am in each and every one of us is this consciousness. So we can conclude that we have no existence other than consciousness. So what is our dharma? Consciousness is our dharma. So consciousness in me is my true nature. It is eternal, permanent thing in me. Body is impermanent. So body will come and go, but consciousness will remain with me. So what happens when I start identifying with this infinite, immortal, blissful consciousness? Instead of the body, when I identify with this all-perfect consciousness, I come to realize a great truth that I am consciousness with a body and not body with consciousness. Consciousness becomes important for me and the body becomes insignificant. I undergo a total change of perception about myself. I perceive myself to be perfect consciousness with an imperfect, insignificant and unimportant body. So there is a total integration that happens in me when I identify myself with consciousness. Now, when I see myself to be consciousness, how will I perceive others? I will see the very same consciousness functioning through different bodies. The rule is what I see in myself, I see in others. If I see myself to be this body, I will see others also to be the bodies. If I consider myself to be consciousness, I will naturally treat others also as consciousness. Meaning, I will see my own self in others also. That is, I will see myself in others. So this knowledge that I am consciousness and not the body brings in the vision of oneness. And what is the result of this vision of oneness? Wherever there is oneness, there is love, compassion, forgiveness, tolerance, etc. Wherever there is oneness, there is a spontaneous expression of eternal values of life. For example, in my whole body, I feel oneness and therefore I love each and every limb of my body unconditionally. My hands, my legs, my ears, my eyes, even if they are ugly, I love them because they are a part of me. So when I see the very same consciousness in me pulsating as life in others also, I develop a vision of oneness and all the eternal values of life come out of me as a byproduct of this vision. So self-knowledge brings in this vision of oneness. And this holy vision leads to all the eternal values of life. And these values of life, when practiced, lead to cosmic balance, cosmic harmony and cosmic orderliness. So if there has to be cosmic orderliness, what is the way? Each and every individual must be made aware of his or her own true nature. So the best way to bring in dharma samsthapana is by promoting spiritual knowledge or self-knowledge. And how can this be done? Bhagavan says, Paritranaya sadhunam. Protect those, encourage those who are living a life of spirituality. Because spiritual people alone can spread spirituality. Spirituality has no existence other than spiritual people. So these spiritual people are called here as sadhus. Those who live a dharmic life based on the teachings of the scriptures. So if we have to promote spirituality, we have to encourage spiritual people. Just like if you want to promote music, you will have to encourage musicians. Because music has no existence other than musicians. So how to promote music? Award the musicians, reward them, fund them, give them land to establish music academies, 
encourage young artists provide opportunities to them to exhibit their talents in the public isn't it similarly if the government wants to encourage science what should they do they will have to support the scientists because science has no existence other than scientists so how will they support the scientists fund them for their research and development give them land to establish research laboratories give them occasion to exhibit the new scientific inventions this is the way you encourage science by supporting the scientists in the same way how to encourage spirituality in the society it is possible only by supporting spiritual people therefore bhagwan says paritranaya sadhuna now the next term vinashaya cha dushkrata now what is the best way of destroying an adharmic person it is not by killing but by giving him the right understanding an adharmic person is adharmic because he doesn't know who he is all his adharmic activities are because of his identification with the body so if the right knowledge the spiritual knowledge is given to him that oh my dear you are not this body but you are consciousness which is the same in everyone if this knowledge is given to him naturally he will become a dharmic person and thus you have destroyed the adharmic tendencies in the adharmic person and you have converted him into dharmic person this is the best way and this can be done only by the brahmanas the teacher class and suppose if this method doesn't work the teaching method doesn't work then the kshatriyas will have to step in so what is the way in which kshatriyas they try to do the dharma samsthapana their method is by punishment and all the harsher ways so if you are not willingly ready to walk the path of dharma you will be forced to walk the path of dharma forcing the people to walk the path of dharma is the job of the kshatriyas the military people the police people it is their job so how is dharma samsthapana done dharma samsthapana is done by these two classes of people the brahmana class and the kshatriya class so bhagwan empowers them and then ensures that dharma samsthapana is attained in the society okay now in the next verse we enter into the main topic of this chapter let us chant the next verse जन्म कर्म च मे दिव्य योवेति तत्वत त्यक्वा देह पुनर्जन्म नैति मेति सूर्जुन भगवान से जन्म कर्म च मे दिव्य मै बर्थ इज डिवाइन जन्म माय बर्थ इज डिवाइन कर्म माय एक्शंस आर डिवाइन दिव्यम डिवाइन सो व्हाट इज भगवान व्हेन डज भगवान टेक बर्थ व्हेन एवर देयर इज अ डिक्लाइन ऑफ धर्म भगवान सेस आई टेक बर्थ भगवान सेस दैट बर्थ इज डिवाइन एंड व्हाट इज अ कर्म ऑफ भगवान धर्म संस्थापना इज अ कर्म ऑफ भगवान भगवान डस धर्म संस्थापना बाय प्रोटेक्टिंग द वर्चुअस and punishing the wicked paritranaya sadhunam vinashaya cha dushkrutam dharma samsthapanarthaya so this is dharma samsthapana is bhagwan's karma now bhagwan says this janma and karma of mine is divine but the next statement which may which bhagwan makes is very strange bhagwan says anyone who knows this in truth tattvatah in reality what that my janma and karma is divine the one who knows this in reality bhagwan says tyaktva deham giving up the body 
पुनर्जन्म न एति ही इज नॉट बॉर्न अगेन देन माम एति ही अटेन्स मी मीनिंग ही बिकम्स वन विथ मी सो भगवान से इज वन हु नोज दैट भगवान जन्म एंड कर्मा इज डिवाइन ही बिकम्स वन विथ भगवान नो इट्स अ वेरी स्ट्रेंज स्टेटमेंट बिकॉज सी knowing my divinity i can become divine but by knowing bhagwan's divinity how can i become divine so therefore we have to understand what is meant by this divinity of janma and karma now from a very superficial standpoint what is the divyatvam of janma and karma from a very superficial standpoint we can say yes भगवान जन्म एंड कर्मा इज डिवाइन बिकॉज दे आर ऑल लीलास भगवान हैज डन लॉट ऑफ इम्पॉसिबल थिंग्स अनथिंकेबल फॉर एनी ह्यूमन बींग्स हिज एक्शन आर कॉल्ड लीलास बिकॉज इट्स अ स्पोर्ट फॉर हिम दीज लीलास आर डन इन ऑर्डर दैट वी कैन डेवलप डिवोशन टूवर्ड्स हिम हेंस हिज जन्म कर्मा दे आर डिवाइन दैट इज फाइन बट in this context the divyatvam of janma and karma will have a different meaning because bhagwan uses the term tatvatah in reality so this has to be analyzed from the absolute standpoint what is this divyatvam of bhagwan's janma and karma what is it that bhagwan is trying to say what bhagwan is trying to say is arjuna Though I am seen to be born, tatvatah in reality I am birthless. Though I am seen to perform lot of actions, but tatvatah in reality I am actually actionless. So here, Bhagwan's birthlessness and actionlessness is the divyatvam. related to janma and karma bhagwan says the one who sees this truth in himself that he is also birthless and actionless just like me such a person has become one with me bhagwan is trying to tell the fact that just like he is birthless and actionless everyone is also birthless and actionless tatvatah in reality bhagwan is saying that the same law is applicable to all the laws are same whether it is for the jiva or for the ishvara and the law is both jiva and ishvara are in reality birthless and actionless now we will take up this topic in detail later because there is a main theme of this chapter here bhagwan is indicating that jiva and ishvara they are not different but they are one and the same jiva is none other than ishvara now arjuna has a question bhagwan is there anyone who has become one with you theoretically yes but did anyone do it practically did anyone attain it in reality now bhagwan answers this question in the next verse let us chant vitaraga bhaya krodha manmaya mam upashrita bahavo jnana tapasa puta madbhava magata भगवान से अर्जुन बहव मद भाव आगता देर आर वेरी मेनी पीपल हू हैव रीच मी बिकम वन विथ माई नेचर हाउ नो हियर इन दिस वर्स भगवान समराइज द एंटायर स्पिरिचुअल साधना सो मेनी टर्म्स आर यूज नो वी विल पुट दीज टर्म्स इन एन ऑर्डर सो फर्स्ट लेट अस टेक मन मया मन मया मीन्स फुल ऑफ मी मन मया फुल ऑफ मी जस्ट लाइक मृण मय मीन्स फुल ऑफ मड चिन्मय मीन्स फुल ऑफ चित कॉन्शियसनेस 
in the same way man maya full of me so this is the first thing to be done what is it keeping god the highest priority in one's life in short valuing god only when you value something intensely you work hard for it all your resources like time money effort they are all channelized to get that which you value the most so man maya means being spiritual minded just like we have money minded people now who are they they are those who consider money as everything in life and hence they work day and night to get it so too we have power hungry people they are mad after power in the same way we have spiritual minded people for them spiritual attainment is the greatest goal of life even they also have duties and responsibilities in the world but they fulfill them in such a way that they move towards god by performing them and as they perform them they grow in devotion dispassion humility gratitude and all other such noble virtues they also have short term goals mid term goals long term goals but these goals are in line with their lifetime goal and what is a lifetime goal attainment of spiritual perfection so how do they meet various obstacles like kama krodh etc which disturb the seekers so the next term mam upashritah taking refuge in me so they invoke the grace of god and win over all weaknesses of the mind in spirituality you have to win over the mind the fight is against your own indisciplined disobedient mind so in this war many times the mind is is very powerful winning over the mind is not easy so what does this seeker do he takes refuge in god strengthened by the grace of god he wins this war against the mind so manmaya ha mam upashrita so manmaya ha means valuing god and putting forth effort keeping god as the goal mam upashrita ha means invoking the grace of god so both are necessary self effort and also grace of god self effort plus grace of god so here is a seeker who lives a life keeping the lord as the goal living a life in tune with the lord doing only such actions which please the lord and overcoming all obstacles by invoking the grace of the lord now what happens to such a person next term vita raga bhaya krodha he becomes free from raga bhaya krodha raga means attachment bhaya means fear krodha means anger in short he becomes free from all kinds of negativities of the mind kama krodha lobha moha mata matsarya everything anger greed lust revenge hatred all the negativities he is able to come over now what is the root cause of all negativities of the mind root cause is only raga or sometimes called as kama raga means attachment attachment towards the world is the root cause of all negativities of the mind you will find that whenever the mind is negative somewhere it is attached to the world so what has this devotee done instead of attaching to the world now he is attached to bhagwan manmaya mam upashritah and because he is attached to bhagwan slowly he becomes detached from the world 
and when he gets detached from the world all the negativities of the mind also slowly vanish and when the negativities of the mind vanish when he grows in all noble virtues like devotion etc then his mind becomes over a period of time pure satvik obedient disciplined peaceful cheerful such a pure mind becomes fit to do the jnana tapas the austerity of knowledge which is the next term what is the next term jnana tapasa puta the ones who are purified by the austerity of self knowledge now what is this jnana tapas jnana tapas is nothing but shravana manana nididhyasana these are the means by which we gain the spiritual knowledge three sadhana shravana manana and nididhyasana all the three put together we say it is jnana tapas practicing these three is called jnana tapas so in shravana you listen to the scriptural teachings from a teacher from a guru you listen so when you listen you gain the spiritual knowledge scriptural knowledge you gain but this knowledge is full of doubts you have lot of questions you have gained the information but there are lot of questions in your mind so what do you do these questions have to be answered in a logical way in a convincing way and this is done by manana scriptures themselves they give the answers to all possible questions so using these answers one has to churn so after a churning process what happens all the doubts vanish the information which i gather becomes conviction conviction means doubtless knowledge so there are no more doubts in my mind all the doubts are cleared shravanena ajnan nivrtih mananena samshay nivrtih doubts vanish what is that all no that alone will not do one may be convinced of a knowledge but still one may not be able to live it the true sign of knowledge is that we should be able to live what we know so what happens is though i am convinced of a knowledge but because of my past habits because of the vasanas gathered in very many births innumerable births of the past though i know certain things i am convinced of certain things but still i am not able to live it the old ways of thinking and behaving still remains in me i still project happiness in the world i still consider myself as jiva though i have studied very many times that i am consciousness that all this jivatva has come because of identification with the body mind intellect though i know all this intellectually i am convinced also but when i live i still tend to live like a jiva so these are all because of the deep rooted vasanas and now these vasanas have to be eradicated so this is a time consuming process we tr- we try to practice whatever we know we try to live whatever we know and this trying to live what we know is called nididhyasana trying to make the knowledge our own so what happens in nididhyasana this conviction becomes transformation now what is the proof that the knowledge has the knowledge has transformed me what is the proof the proof is that in all situations i am able to respond based on this newly gained spiritual knowledge earlier i used to negatively react to situations now i am able to positively respond to situations 
meaning this spiritual knowledge is readily available to me it has become one with my personality then we say yes the knowledge has truly become ours so the whole process is called jnana tapas gaining the knowledge removing all the doubts and making this knowledge our own trying to transform ourselves with this knowledge shravana manana nididhyasana this is called jnana tapas so what happens to such a person who does this tapas jnana tapas aputaha purified by this jnana tapas so over a period of time what happens is slowly slowly he is able to disidentify with his body mind intellect he is able to completely identify with consciousness in him which is infinite and immortal which is none other than god himself so such a seeker rather such seekers who have totally identified with consciousness bhagwan says mad bhavam agataha they reach me and how many are there bahavah very many arjuna very many have done this sadhana and they have reached me manmayah maam upasritah vitaraga bhay krodhah jnana tapasa putah mad bhavam agatah so the first stage is purification of mind through karma yoga then gaining the knowledge through jnana yoga so following this path very many have reached me they have become one with me now arjuna had a question bhagwan if there is such a great knowledge gaining which one can become one with you then bhagwan why is it that you don't give it to all being the lord of all bhutanam ishwara you have said earlier so being the creator of all the lord of all you must give this greatest knowledge to one and all without any partiality this is one question also from their side why is it that very few people seek this knowledge why is it that majority of them are not seeking you this is my second question so there are two questions firstly why is it that from your side you don't enforce this highest knowledge to all and secondly from their side why is it that majority are not seeking this knowledge now bhagwan is answering these two questions let us chant verse number 11 and 12 ये यथाम्यहम मम वर्तमे मनुष्या पार्थ सर्वश काकर्मण सिद्धि यजत इह देवता क्षिप्रम हिमाषे लोके सिद्धिर्भवति कर्मजा यस सो फर्स्ट भगवान आंसर्स द फर्स्ट क्वेश्चन वाई भगवान डस इन गिव दिस नॉलेज टू ऑल सो वॉट डज भगवान से वर्स नंबर इलेवन ये यथा माम प्रपद्यंते इन वॉट एवर वे पीपल एप्रोच मी tans tathaiva bhajamy hum in the same way i bless them in whatever way people approach me in the same way i bless them so bhagwan says arjuna i never force anyone for anything i am a very democratic person different people approach me with different attitude with different desires with different relationships whatever be their approach i bless them accordingly so so do bhagwan is nirguna nirakara attributeless and formless but for a shiva worshipper he appears like shiva for a vishnu devotee he takes the form of vishnu for a jesus follower he appears as jesus and for a non believer 
ही अपीयर्स नॉन एग्जिस्टेंट ये यथा माम प्रपद्यंते तांस तथैव भजाम्य हम अगेन डिवोटीज अप्रोच गॉड विथ डिफरेंट नीड्स फॉर एग्जाम्पल सम आर आर्थ भक्त दे हैव लॉट्स ऑफ प्रॉब्लम्स डिफिकल्टीज एफ्लिक्शंस दे सी गॉड टू रिमूव दीज सफरिंग्स एंड सम अदर्स आर अर्थार्थी भक्त दे सीक नेम फेम वेल्थ पावर पोजिशन पोजिशन एक्सेट्रा एंड देर आर जिज्ञासु भक्त दे नीड भगवान एलो सो डिपेंडिंग अपॉन द नीड देर आर वेरियस टाइप्स ऑफ डिवोटीज Again, devotees keep different types of relationship with Bhagwan. Some see Bhagwan as father, some see Bhagwan as mother, some see Bhagwan as their master, some see Bhagwan as their beloved, some see Bhagwan as their child, and there are people who see Bhagwan as their enemy also, like Shishupal. Shishupal. So devotees have different types of relationship. so bhagwan says according to your attitude according to your need according to your according to the relationship you have chosen with me i bless you accordingly ye yatha mam prapadyante tan stathaiva bhajamya so bhagwan does in force because devotees are at different evolutionary levels at different maturity levels not all are fit for the highest and the best just because something is best doesn't mean it should be given to all one must also see the qualification of the receiver if the receiver doesn't value the thing which you give then it should not be given this lesson we must learn from bhagwan one boy asked the other boy what did you gift your grandmother on her 90th birthday the other boy said football The first boy was shocked. Football? Are you crazy? The other boy said, "Yeah, on my birthday she gave me Bhagavad Gita. So therefore, on her birthday I gave her football." So just because you value something doesn't mean everyone should value it. So when you give something, you must see the need of the other person. so bhagwan says arjuna i don't force anyone for this knowledge what they ask i give them i am like sunlight i enter into the room only if the doors and windows are open i don't force my way in if they are shut i patiently wait outside now bhagwan answers the second question what is the second question why is it that majority of the people don't seek bhagwan Now Bhagwan's answer is in the twelfth verse. Bhagwan says, "Arjuna, it is because they want quick results. Kshipram hi manushe loke siddhir bhavati karma ja. People have no patience at all. They want immediate results, and in the world you get immediate results. Now let us just think: what are the reasons why majority of the people don't take up the path of spirituality?" why majority of the people are materialistic they are worldly reason number 1 in spirituality results cannot be proved i might have seen god but i cannot prove it to you you might have realized god but you cannot prove it to others as far as science is concerned results can be proved whatever you claim when you show it when you show the result then that becomes a proof you don't need faith for it but that is not the case with spirituality you need faith in the existence of god you need faith in the means to reach there you need faith in the teacher you need faith that this god can be realized so in spirituality everything starts with faith and this becomes the first catastrophe why people don't choose this path 
our own lack of faith can become an obstacle in taking up spirituality this is reason number 1 reason number 2 in spirituality there is lot of discipline insisted especially the discipline at the level of mind getting up early doing puja japa meditation bhajan study reflection contemplation moderation in eating moderation in sleeping and if you are a swami you can't even visit very many places like film theaters and mall people will stare at you as though you are an animal who has escaped from a zoo <laughs> so the point is lot of control at the mind level is insisted in spirituality controlling the mind is like pushing the rock to the top of the mountain pushing the rock to the top of the mountain so spiritual joy is no doubt the highest but it demands a heavy price greater the thing greater is the price it demands for the original thing even in the worldly level for the original thing you have to pay heavy duplicates come cheap So in spirituality, a heavy price is demanded in terms of mental discipline. Whereas in gaining worldly joy, it is very easy. You have to just indulge. To indulge, no sadhana is necessary. No discipline is necessary. It is like rolling the rock down the mountain slope. No effort. Very easy. So these pleasures are cheap, and it is available easily without any discipline. this is reason number 2 reason number 3 in spirituality the results come after long long practice and is a result of lifelong discipline what about the worldly joy it is experience the moment you indulge so this reason is with respect to the time delay in spirituality results come after long time whereas in as far as the worldly joy is concerned the result is immediate put the laddu in your mouth and there you are you get instant joy no waiting needed so bhagwan said kshipram siddhir bhavati reason number 4 in the world results are gross and tangible you can see it experience it show it to others take pride in it wealth power position they are all gross can be appreciated easily whereas in spirituality results are subtle it cannot be so easily perceived for example purity of mind right understanding about life they are all subtle hence difficult to appreciate and therefore that which is difficult to appreciate becomes difficult to gain inspiration from that which is difficult to understand cannot inspire us gaining inspiration from difficult thing is difficult this is reason number 4 reason number 5 majority of the people being immature they see only the immediate pleasures of the world but they are not sensitive enough to see the evil consequences of this indulgence so what is this reason the short sightedness of people they don't have that long vision what are the long lasting consequences in the long run what is going to happen they don't have this vision they are immature majority of them what is the nature of these worldly pleasures bhagwan says agre amrutopamam pariname vishamiva in the beginning it is like nectar but in the end it is like poison what about spirituality it is just the reverse agre vishamiva in the beginning poison pariname amrutopamam in the end it is like nectar so majority of the people being immature and insensitive 
they fall in the trap of this immediate pleasure offered by the world. So these are the reasons why people generally follow the path of prayers. Path of prayers means the path of the pleasant and they ignore the path of the shreyas, the path of the good. That's how these two paths are described by Lord Yamaraj, Lord Death in Kathopanishad. Yes. So how do these worldly people gain their worldly attainments? Bhagavan says, Kangshanta Karmanam Siddhim Seeking success, seeking fulfillment through their actions. What do they do? Yajanta Iha Devata They worship Devatas, they worship Gods. So in order to attain the worldly gain, they worship Gods. Now who are these Gods? Who are these Devatas? Now Devatas will have different meaning according to the context. It will have different meaning with regard to Adhi Devika, Adhi Bhautika and Adhyatmika levels. So at the Adhyatmika level, what does Devata mean? Adhyatmika means pertaining to this body. So in this context, Devata means sense organs. Deva means to illumine. So Devata means that which illumines, that which help us, help us know. And what are the things to know? Shapta, Sparsha, Rupa, Rasagandha. So who help us in knowing this? They are called Devatas. So eyes illumine the world of colors and forms. Ears illumine the world of sound. So they are all Devatas. Now, worshipping this Devata means what? What does it mean? Here, worshipping means offering. So what do you offer to these sense organs? Sense organs, into the sense organs you offer sense objects. So sense objects are offered to the respective sense organs and this is called worshipping. All worshipping is in terms of offering. We offer fruits, flowers, clothes, kunkuma, chandana, naivedya, dhupa, deepa, arti, etc. Isn't it? In the same way, we offer sense objects to these sense organs. And what happens when sense organs come in contact with sense objects? There is a pleasure. And this pleasure is immediate. No time delay. Like eating laddu. So at the Adhyatmika level, indulgence in pleasure is what is meant by worshipping the Devatas. Now from Adi Bhautika level, what does it mean? So here Devatas mean highly influential people in the society. Adi Bhautika means related to the world, pertaining to the world. So in the world, influential people are called Devatas. They have power. And you can make use of this power if these Devatas are approached in the right way. So if you want to get something done through some government official, now this government official is the Devata. He has some power related to his department. So what to do to please this Devata? How do you worship this Devata? So you may have to grease his palms, you have to do a lot of under table transactions and then when the Devata is pleased with your offerings, he blesses you. He blesses you by giving government sanctions, government approval for your plan, for your work. So getting things done by influencing the influential people. This is called worshipping Devata at the worldly level. Now from Adi, Daiv, Adi Daivika level, what does it mean? Here, from Adi Daivika level, Devatas means various presiding deities. So many Devatas are there. Shani Devata, Rahu, Ketu and all that. They are all Devatas. They are all presiding deities with certain parts pertaining to their departments. So each Devata has his own mode of worship. There is a mantra to be chanted, there is a ritual to be performed, there is a naivedya, particular naivedya to be offered. And in this time only it should do, in this place only it should do. There are so many conditions. When this worship is done, fulfilling all these conditions, that Devata is pleased and he blesses you with whatever you desire. 
So you get immediate results. Maybe within few days or few weeks, you get it. So Bhagavan says, worshipping these devatas bring in quick results. So therefore, people generally adopt these worldly means where the results are quick. Whereas in spirituality, the goal is very vague, goal is very far, the path is difficult, the joy appears to be in a distant future, and hence therefore, generally, people are put off with regard to the spiritual path. They don't take up spiritual path. This is what Bhagavan says. But then Bhagavan says, Someday or the other, everyone has to come to spiritual life. See the 11th verse, second line. Mama Vartma Anuvartante Manushyaha Partha Sarvashaha Everyone has to follow my path, the path of spirituality, someday or the other. Why is it so? Worldly pleasures are impermanent and pain giving. So someday everyone has to take up spiritual path. The sufferings and pain, they slowly make the person sensitive. They make the person mature. It will take a long time. If not in this birth, maybe after thousands of births. But this has to happen. They will become mature. They will become sensitive. After very many experiences, we are all becoming evolved. Just like every drop of water in the river has to reach the ocean. Someday or the other, similarly consciously or unconsciously, knowingly or unknowingly, we are all heading towards the ocean of bliss of consciousness. So Bhagavan says, Mama Vartma Anuvartante Manushya Partha Sarvasha. Even an atheist, what is he seeking? He is seeking happiness. He is seeking security. He may not believe in God, but ultimately what he is seeking? Happiness, security, peace, etc. So someday he has to come to the very source of peace, source of happiness. So even an atheist is knowingly or unknowingly, not knowingly or unknowingly, unknowingly. So even an atheist is unknowingly seeking Bhagavan alone. So all of us, we are seeking God alone. Right, more of it we will see tomorrow. Om Sarve Bhavantu Sukhinaha Sarve Santu Niramaya Sarve Bhadrani Pashyantu Makas Chiddukha Bhag Bhavet Asatoma Sadgamaya Tamasoma Jyotir Gamaya Mrityorma Amritam Gamaya Om Shanti 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 Hari Om Shri Guru Bhyo Namaha Hari Om